Hello, everyone, and happy old new year. Sastarim Novum Gordum. My name is James, and I am the events manager for RBCC London. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to our first event of the Russo British Chamber of Commerce webinar series in 2021. Today's event is kindly hosted by William Grant and Sons. And just before I start with the introduction of our speakers, I'd like to mention a few ground rules. Please can you all make sure that you have your microphone on mute during the virtual tour. And if you have any questions, do type them out instead of, uh, yeah, instead of using uh, your microphone for the time being. Um, we have the chat, chat function at the bottom, so feel free to use that. Um, the event will be recorded and also posted on our website at a later date as well. We're delighted to welcome our speakers today, Struan Grant Ralph and Alex Walker. Struan is from uh, Speeside, which is the home of Glenn Fiddick. Uh, he has been with Glenn Fiddick for nine years. He has previously been based in Singapore, New York, and London, and now lives up at the distil distillery. He's the gr global brand ambassador for William Grant and Sons, and he manages 24 local national brand ambassadors around the world. He's visited over 80 countries and did his first ever whiskey tasting in Mongolia. And he hosted a whiskey tasting uh, up on top of a glacier in Iceland as well. And Alex Walker started his hospitality career in Australia, where he became absorbed in the world of bartending before moving back to England to become the head bartender uh, in one of Manchester's best known neighborhood bars. In 2016, he moved to London working in two of the cities and indeed the world's most pre prestigious hotel bars, uh, the Beaufort Bar in uh, the Savoy, and also most recently, uh, the Artesian Bar at the Langham. He's now the Glenfiddich National Brand Ambassador at William Grant and Sons. Um, thank, a very warm, warm welcome to you both, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, please take it away, um, Strun and Alex. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, James. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to join you all. Uh, this evening uh, up in up in Speyside. Uh, unfortunately, not at the distillery just now, although I live very close to Glenfiddich um, up in the northeast uh, of Scotland, um, much like most of us in the UK currently on uh, currently on lockdown, um, which means we can't broadcast from the, the distillery, but we're going to we're going to do um, something kind of almost as good by, you know, um, showing you a virtual tour and uh, showing you a little bit of the, the Glenfiddich history and culture and the whiskey making process as well. So, yeah, um, thanks, James, for the, the kind introduction. And um, Alex, I'll hand over to you for a quick introduction as well. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you, James. And thank you for everybody for joining us uh, on this most kind of, it's quite chilly. I'm based down in London, so I don't, I'm not sure what the weather's like in glorious Scotland, but it is very, very chilly down in London at the moment. Um, so that's why I'm broadcasting to you live from. Um, and yes, yeah, as Struan said, it's it's these kind of occasions going online, virtual experiences. Um, we do just keep them as kind of conversational as possible. So as James said, if you have any questions, do feel free, pop them in the chat um, and we'll be taking you around the virtual, um, around the distillery virtually. So please feel free ask away, ask questions in the chat, and then we'll do our best to answer them um, as, as, as we can. So yes, amazing. To, to kick things off, I suppose we should really start with um, an idea of uh, where Glenfiddich kind of world of, of whiskey, and hopefully we have some, hopefully we'll have some real whiskey fans um, here on the, on the conversation tonight. Um, we are a single malt whiskey. Uh, we arguably a sort of leader of the single malt category. Uh, and by that, I mean that we're one of the first distilleries to ever really start exporting single malt, talking about it in the world. And we were um, very closely involved with defining what that category meant. Um, I know that uh, you, you guys are all involved in a chamber of commerce, so you'll appreciate the efforts that a company can define and market a category. Um, so Glenfiddich started leaving our distillery up here in Dufton uh, as a single malt back in 1962, 1963. Um, and since then, we've always been a leader of that category and represented it around the world. So we were given the Queen's Award for Export for Single Malt um, all the way back in the 1970s. 
essentially just reflecting the fact that we'd created a brand new category of British produce, Scottish produce, and then we were actively marketing it around the world. So um, those of you that are really into your whiskey, I'm sure Glenfiddich is a, is a name that you're familiar with. Um, and perhaps those of you that are just um, learning a little bit more about what whiskey is and uh, the different kind of styles. Um, Glenfiddich means Valley of the Deer. It's a, it's a Scottish Gaelic uh, term, uh, Glen meaning valley, and um, Glen, Glen meaning valley, and Fiddich meaning stag or deer. So my name itself, Struan, actually is a Gaelic, uh, Struan is a Gaelic word. It means water or running water in Gaelic. So maybe only appropriate that I worked in the whiskey industry all this long with a, with a, name, with a name like that. Alex, what does your name mean in Gaelic? I, honestly, I'm not sure. Maybe you can maybe you can tell me. My name's Alexander. Well, in Scotland, you would become Sandy straight away. Exactly. I think I think maybe the same in Russia, right? Yeah. Alexander becomes Sandy. Sandy. I think we call it Sasha. Sasha. Sa Sa Sasha. Sasha. Yeah. Sasha. Uh, certainly, we have um, some great colleagues in Russia, Alexander, who, who we do call Sasha. We also have our um, Russian ambassador on the call, which is great to see. Um, so Glenfiddich is represented by many different brand ambassadors uh, around the world. Um, as James mentioned earlier, 24 of us now, which is a, is a big team. Uh, and Andre Udavista uh, is uh, also joining us, I think probably from Moscow. How are you, Andre? Can you say hello? Hi, everyone. Hey, Andre. This is probably a good opportunity to speak Russian. Um, me and Alex won't have a clue what you're saying, but. Hello. How's it? Where are you just now? Moscow. In Moscow. Hi, Andrew. So, guys, the, um, the, the tour that we want to take you on is basically going to allow you to have a look at the Glenfiddich Distillery. Um, we would love to obviously welcome everybody up to our distillery whenever we can. We have, you know, a great visitor center and a, um, a really unique kind of visitor experience um, up at Glenfiddich. But we're on, we're on lockdown and we have been, you know, for, for some months now. So we have a, a distillery tool where we can actually take you around. So um, we can start that. Hopefully some of you have got some whiskey at home to, to taste and have a, have a little sip on it. It is, it is Thursday evening. And it's lockdown, so it, I think the normal rules are out the window at this point. But this, I mean, if you manage to wait this long into the week to have your first dram, then um, congratulations, because I'm not sure everybody managed that. Um, a dram, a dram in Scotland, we should clarify. A dram is obviously a wee measure of whiskey. What's what would a dram be in in Russia, Andre? Is there a name? Oh, I can't hear you, mate. Sorry. I was always brought up in my bartending career as a dram was an undisclosed amount between the bartender and the recipient. Yeah. So it's a glug, a healthy, a healthy pull. Yeah. A dram up here is just, uh, yeah, a dram of whiskey is basically something that the pourer is happy to pour and the recipient is happy to pour and... <laughs> Moving back up to Scotland, we have something called house drams, which is like if you go to someone's house, you basically measure their hospitality by the size of the dram they've poured you. So <laughs> some of my friends, you you get pretty intimidated by the size of their house drams. So I'm going to share our um, virtual distillery. Can everybody see that? Holding page? Okay, great. Um, so like we said, uh, Glenfiddich, uh, the Valley of the Deer, this is our logo and um, actually in the area that I live up here in Speyside you will see many of these you know wonderful animals uh, we obviously have the the rut of the stags kind of the tail end of of last year in November into December and now we have snow outside at the moment so my dog is pretty much chasing all the deer tracks around about the back of the garden here so a lot of a lot of deer actually I suppose the, the, the things that Speyside is incredibly famous for first and foremost whiskey um second of all 
fishing, so the Spey River, and if you're a keen um, salmon fisher or you're a, a keen outdoorsman, then Speyside is an incredible um, area for for fishing and for as particularly fly fishing up here, incredible salmon. Actually, at the start of the um, salmon fishing season, they pour a bottle of Glenfiddich 12 year old into the spay for good luck during the salmon fishing season, which I think it makes the fish easier to catch on that day. And um, I think they taste they taste better. I don't it know. already starts as a curing process. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I've been doing that for 39 years. <laughs> so hopefully you can all see the, the footage that you, you're getting through here. And this is the beautiful surroundings of Speyside. There are a huge amount of single malt whiskey distilleries up here. Um, the, if you stand in the centre of Dufton, which is the closest town to, to Glenfiddich, and it's about 10 miles from where I am right now, um, you're surrounded by distilleries, maybe over 60 single malt distilleries all within 10 miles. Um, first and foremost, this is really due to the kind of terroir, the, the conditions of the surrounding area. If you want to make world class whiskey, you need an abundance of really good, clean water. In the case of Glenfiddich, this comes from the, the spring which you just saw, which is called the Robbie Dew Spring. Again, it's a, a Gallic word. Um, in English, it would be Black Robert, and a, he was the farmer. So Black Robert has an incredible farm up on a hillside. Um, supposedly, he was called Black Robert because he wasn't very clean, and uh, I always thought that was ironic for someone who had such great water. Um, but the the Robbie Dew Spring became the you know the water source for Glenfiddich um, ever since our founding, all the way back in the in the eighteen eighties. The other thing which you can you can see right now is the barley. So if you want to make single malt whiskey, you need barley. Um, single basically means it's coming from one single distillery and single malt means that it's all made from malted barley. So that means you need a really fertile, you know, ideal gro growing conditions um, for growing this wonderful thing, which is barley. So the fields around my house are all barley fields um, at the moment. They're great for dog walking because there's no barley in them, just snow. Um, and that's, that's a, uh, the, the river that you can see there is the, the Spey River, which gives the whole sort of region its, uh, its name, essentially. So this is where we are in the world. I, must, I think... Um, are most of the people on the call based in, in London or have we have a, do we have a bit of a mix around the world? I think we have a mixture of uh, Russian and British attendees from, from both sides. Yeah, I think it's 50-50 on this call. Mm. Okay, great. So you, you all know where Scotland is, I'm sure. Um, the... The interesting thing actually about where we are, we're further north than Moscow up here in, um, up here in, uh, in Speyside, but we have the benefit of the wonderful Gulf Stream, which keeps us pretty uh, hot or hotter than we should be. So we have quite a nice temperate climate for, um, for making whiskey, but also growing the raw materials. Uh, so as I'm sure a lot of you will know, Scotland is above a very small country called England. And when I say above, I mean geographically, but also spiritually, you know, um, mentally. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, Alex, you know. I'm, I'm, it's okay, I'll, I'll remember that the next time I'm in Scotland, it's true. <laughs> um, and I don't know if any of you have, um, have, have come north of the border, but I, I, I definitely like uh, recommend that you do. Um, and Scotland just has an abundance of great distilleries, probably put whiskey on the map around the world. Scotch whiskey is known and loved, you know, wherever you go. We are about 400 miles north of our two kind of biggest cities, so Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, and Speyside historically would have been a fantastic place to make whiskey because whiskey at certain times of its history has been illegal, or at least it was taxed very heavily by our friends. 
uh, in the south. And, uh, and this is why, actually, if you look at Scotland, you will find that a lot of the great distilleries are really based up in the, in the north, as we are here in Speyside. So what I like about this map is um, what we've done here is just taken England right off the bottom, uh, which we tried to do by voting uh, a few years ago, but that didn't work. So we just, uh, we've introduced just, uh, uh, <laughs> and this is an independent Scotland, Alex. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to do the bartender trick again and not talk about politics. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. We I'm should. staying out of it. I'm staying out of it. Uh, the great thing about this map in all seriousness is you can now see some of the regionality of whiskey. So if you're getting into your single malts, then one of the great places to start is by getting an idea of which region you're going to like the flavor from. So for example, the lowlands of Scotland, um, very obviously down in the lowlands, the lowest landing area of the country, typically associated with being quite um, delicate, quite subtle, they used to be known as the, the, the Lowland Ladies. Um, quite often, whiskies of the Lowlands were triple distilled, um, for example. Um, uh, whiskies of the Highlands, uh, you know, to, to sort of counteract that, were often known for being more robust, more complex. Um, perhaps they would have an influence of, you know, some saltiness if they were more like uh, coastal Highlands, or they would have maybe the delicate, like, um, aromas of like honey or big full kind of floral flavors if they're things like Glenmorangie or Dalwini, they were central highlands. <clears throat> You've got uh, a really interesting array of islands down Scotland. So Scotland, depending on where the tide is, has around 900 islands. And um, we define an island by an area that you could actually rear one sheep. I just found this out quite recently. So if it's big enough to have one sheep on it, Technically, in Scotland, that tends to mean that it would probably have one guy on it as well, chasing it around. I don't know. Well, let's not get into that. too. We haven't had a whiskey yet. Uh, the, um, the most famous of the whiskey islands would be Isla, so down here in the southwest. And then you have the beautiful islands of Skye, the Orkneys, the, the Outer Hebrides, all of which have their own traditions of whiskey making. And typically, those whiskies would be made using peat. So... If you've ever tried a whiskey and it was very smoky and it was coming at you with this real kind of um, full kind of bonfire aroma, um, then it was a whiskey that was made using peat. Typically on the mainland of Scotland, they use coal or anthracite as we do normally. And on the islands of Scotland, um, you know, it's uh, Jura, Mull, Skye, Orkney, Shetland, uh, very often peated. Not as a rule, there are great uh, island whiskies that are not peated. So that brings us into, uh, well, you've got one, you've got one very small area called Campbelltown, and uh, that's a way down here. Has anyone ever been to Campbelltown? Well, show of hands. Nope. See, I think there are people from Campbelltown who don't admit to having been to Campbelltown. <laughs> it's not... Um, it's not the most attractive place in the world, but at one point it was the epicenter of Scottish whiskey making, away down here in the in the southwest. Um, particularly during the 1920s, 1930s, um, because you had uh, a crazy concept called prohibition over in America, and Campbelltown was very well equipped to be exporting Scotch whiskey. Um, if you head west from Campbelltown, the next thing you hit is the essentially like the eastern seaboard of America. So the Campbelltown whiskies used to be thriving, but there was some quality issues and um, there's, uh, it's incredibly difficult to get to as well. Well, Campbelltown. Which brings us to us here in Speyside. Uh, has anyone ever been up into Speyside, been to any of our distilleries? Well, we look forward to welcoming you when all this, when all this crazy, when all this crazy stuff dies down. We'll, uh, we have uh, incredible Highland hospitality up here, and um, certainly the amount of whiskey that we have doesn't help either. Uh, Alex, from um, 
from your point of view, talking about flavour, how do you sort of define the, the different whiskey making regions and their, their different associated flavours? Well, I definitely think as we are now in, in this day and age, I think it, it, it has kind of varied from people's preconceptions of regionality in, in essence. So as you said in, before with the Lowlands known to be quite light, um, floral, the, the ladies of the Lowlands, moving over to Isla, that kind of heavy peat um, association with smokiness and harshness and sometimes that kind of almost medicinal smoke that puts people off. And then into the Highlands and Speyside. Now, traditionally, Speyside would be known for creating those light and fruity styles of single malt, especially for the, the people that I talk to. Um, Speyside is known for creating light and fruity single malts, but that regionality concept is almost being kind of thrown away now in terms of you can make a peated, heavily smoked single malt whiskey in Speyside now, whereas people's preconceptions were they were only left for the, the islands. And as you said, the two kind of flavor profiles of those regions do vary, but it is possible to make something smoky, heavily smoky, heavily peated in the highlands and not necessarily with the, with only the island whiskies nowadays, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, this, this map serves as a really good guide. And certainly, you know, wherever you are on your sort of single malt or your whiskey journey, it is quite nice to get a sense of if you do like the taste of Glenfiddich, for example, there's a good chance that a handful of the distilleries around us will be quite similar. But that's not a hard and fast rule. And actually, in modern whiskey making, you can make a peated whiskey in California, you know, uh, um, what are they called? West, uh, Westlands or High West? I can't remember. I have them, I have them from here. Um, certainly, if you went back maybe a decade, this, 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 this map and this regionality was much more of a, much more of a kind of hard and fast rule. Mm. We should, we'll maybe go on to define just a little bit about where single malt and scotch fits in. So in the world of whiskey, uh, you, can, you can trace its origins back to either um, monks in Scotland or monks in Ireland. Certainly it was the monks and holy men that lay claim to creating quite a lot of the world's great alcoholic produce. Um, Dom Perignon with champagne, um, the monks of the Benedictine collective, you know, with French liqueurs. Um, and certainly for us, the earliest records of whiskey making in Scotland are around about the sort of 13th or 14th century. Um, so we've been doing this for rather a long time. Um, and there are various sites in Scotland which lay claim to being the first sort of distillery, but that's a, that's a, long, a long sort of debate. But there's certainly an area just outside Edinburgh um, at Lindor's, Lindor's Abbey. Uh, where our, our old man called Friar John Corr used to distill back in 1492. And he's the first person to actually write down his orders. But if you're writing down orders and you're, you know, actually selling whiskey, there's a good chance that our industry had existed for, you know, rather a long time before that. There's a good chance it also arrived via um, Benedictine orders of monks, which would have been traced through Europe into Ireland and then come to Scotland after that. Um, we always like to say the, the, the Scots are just Irish people that could swim uh, and wanted to move somewhere <coughs> colder and wetter. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> you can probably trace whiskey distilling across the Irish Sea. You know, at points of our West Coast, you can see Ireland, you know, on a, on a nice day, which is about every four years uh, over <laughs> the... Um... So we have you know, 500 years of whiskey distilling, you know, tradition in Scotland. Uh, and within that, we have two main sort of groups of, uh, of whiskey that's produced, blended scotch and single malt. Um, blended scotch, you'll probably know a handful of those big names. Um, the William Grant family is responsible for making Grant, which is a blended scotch or stand fast. Uh, and then you have you know, other great whiskey merchants of their day, the Chivas brothers making Chivas Regals, um, the Ballantines making Ballantines, Tommy Dewar, the whiskey baron, and the Victorian era making Dewars. Um, a very, very small company called, is it John Walker or John? I can't remember. It's a small startup uh, boutique company. 
Uh, they, they sell like 22 million cases of whiskey a year. Oh, you got some there. Oh, Dimple, is it? David? Cardew. Uh -huh. um, and really, I suppose you could say that it was these large whiskey houses that put Scotch whiskey on the map. Um, and certainly for us in, in Scotland, we have a lot of you know things to thank for that phenomenon. Um, around about the time when Scotch whisky makers were getting kind of in their pomp and getting talented at making whisky, you have a phylloxera virus that kind of destroys sherry, cognac, port, like the great harvest of the world. Um, Scotch whisky was well positioned, you know, to take advantage of that. Um, and also you have at the bottom line, Scotland is so well equipped for making good whisky. Like it's very wet, it's pretty cold most of the time. Um, you know, a lot of very talented craftspeople up here in terms of, um, you know, mastering the craft of making whiskey. And yeah, we have this, you know, great tradition. And if you had to break down the world's whiskey categories, blended scotch is by far and away the kind of the world leader in, in terms of just what people are drinking out with sort of Indian and domestic whiskies. Uh, and then you have Irish whiskey, American whiskey, Canadian, Japanese whiskey, um, all the way through all the different cultures uh, of whiskey making, all subtly different. Uh, but certainly, you would say that they have their origins here in Scotland. Anything else on that, Alex? I think, I think you pretty much covered that. So I, I couldn't possibly think of anything to add. So this is where the world's biggest single malt whiskey distillery now stands. So this is the Valley of the Deer the Glen of the Fiddich. Uh, and this is back in uh, the 1870s before our distillery is built. A couple of things of interest, I suppose. If you were building a distillery back in Victorian times, uh, William Grant, our founder, was looking for the perfect land to build his dream distillery. He'd spent his entire life saving money. He had a large family, seven sons and two daughters. And his dream was essentially to start making single malt whiskey back in the 1880s. And he finds this, uh, this site that we can see here. Um, number one, in the Victorian times, gravity is your friend if you're gonna build a distillery. So you wanna be in a valley facing downhill, he's got that. You've got a train line here that runs right into Speyside. And the train line in those days was really the main artery if you wanted to bring in barley or casks, if you wanted to export whiskey, um, raw materials, the train line was the thing that really brought, you know, distilling to Glenfiddich. Um, and you also had um, William Grant's ability to rent this land. He rented it from the Duke of Gordon, um, who's also known as the, the Duke of Richmond. Um, and that land has now been in the hands of the William Grant family since, since 1887. Um, we can see a little bit sort of further into our future. Glenfiddich is, is built by hand uh, by William Grant's seven sons and two daughters who I, who I mentioned. The, um, the distillery finds you know, success um, very, very early on and grows incredibly quickly uh, to the point where you know, we have this, um, this great distillery. This is uh, looking back into the 1890s. Uh, and we're getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves here, but this is um, the distillery as you would have seen it in the 1920s. Some of the points to note here, you have the use of peat, that's a peat stack. So this wonderful thing that um, you know we use to dry our barley or to heat our stills. And um, yeah, the distillery's kind of evolved you know, from there. So, but I've just, I, think, I feel like I jumped a little bit ahead of myself there, so. Uh, I find it really annoying when people uh, host whiskey tastings but don't encourage people to drink whiskey. So why don't we take this opportunity? Uh, Alex, do you want to guide the guys through a tasting of Glenfiddich 12 year old? Of course. Uh, and I'll just play, um, I'll loop the stillhouse loop for you, okay? So as you can see here, we are delving deep into our stillhouse where we do the distillation process of Glenfiddich. And Struan was telling me a, a funny story. Is it around the back of Stillhouse number two, where you get the aroma of Glenfiddich 12? So 
Grand Prix 12. Now, you don't have to have a, a German Grand Prix 12. If you do, grab a, a, a little jam of whiskey. And as you can see here, our still room is obviously where we do the distillation process of Glenfiddich. And if you head out the back of the still room, you can actually smell that aroma of Glenfiddich 12. But Glenfiddich 12 as, a, as an idea is a long way away from what this originally was intended to be. So William Grant set out, he left Mortlach after 20 years of building up knowledge, making the best drum in the valley was his goal. That was his lifelong ambition to make the best drum in the valley. Now this, what we have in our glass, and you can see the bottle behind me of the Glenfiddich 12, is a long, long way away from what it would have originally been like. So going back to the, the idea of regionality, Glenfiddich used to be a heavily peated and heavily sherry whiskey because of numerous reasons. As Struan pointed out, that big peat stack, that was used for drying our barley. Nowadays, we use smokeless fuels that impart no flavor of smoke or peat. That's what normally what you would get when you burn a peated uh, a peat, peat, sorry, to dry your barley. That latches itself onto the barley. And then when you put it through the distillation process, you end up with a peated whiskey. If you fast forward 133 years, more or less, this particular whiskey, or our original 12 in its current incarnation, has been through a lot of different incarnations over the years. So from um, that kind of 1887 to 1963, we went through a period of being peated, heavily peated. In 1963, we effectively launched the single malt Scotch whiskey category outside of Scotland. It went into America and we launched it as a straight malt. Now, a straight malt, we did this for for a number of reasons again, mostly to distinguish ourselves away from a double malt that was found in America, and that was a beer. Now, essentially, Glenfiddich starts its life as a beer and then gets distilled. You separate the, uh, the alcohol away from that beer base, and as you can see here, that's exactly what's happening. So we wanted to distinguish ourselves as a straight malt. Now, from 1963 up until where we are now in 2000, I almost said 2020, it's 2021, thankfully now, um, it has been over the course of numerous different ages. It's been over eight years old with no age statement. And then we only settled on 12 years old in the year 2000. So essentially this whiskey in its current state has only been a 12 year old whiskey for 21 years. Kind of hard to believe when you look at the lifespan of Glenfiddich. And it, we only decided to put that 12 year old mark on the bottle of Glenfiddich in the year 2000. So the actual whiskey itself as I mentioned in the very, very beginning of what I was talking about regionality, it is that light and fruity style of space I had single malt. And hence why it's so much different to what William Grant was making back in 1887, which would have been heavily peated and heavily sherry, mostly because of the, again, availability of fuel sources and availability of casks. Now, casks are extremely important when it comes to making whiskey. In the Glenfiddich 12, as you can see, we use a combination of American and European oak now, the American oak lends itself to those deep, rich, sweet vanilla flavors that you would expect to find from vanilla oak, uh, sorry, from um, American oak. And this has a lot to do with the compounds found inside the oak. So those wood sugars that are left inside or vanillin lends itself to vanilla flavors. Now, the fresh and fruity side, again, comes from, in essence, several things to do with our whiskey making process. So we have a very, very high fermentation time. We go to 72 hours, which is very, very high which allows us to have those almost kind of candied pear drop to, uh, notes to this particular whiskey. And you'll also see that we have two distinct types of stills. Now these again, lend ourselves, there we are, you can play it again. So we're gonna dive right back into the still house. And again, we have two different types. So that essentially is unique to us. So we acquired our, our stills um, from Cardu, um, originally, and we then recreated them using our coppersmiths on site. So we actually had a company make the stills and then we have coppersmiths on site to maintain them for us. So all these little touches, again, doing things in our way, kind of going above and beyond and pushing that extra step every moment that we can to create something that is entirely unique. So Glenfiddich 12, as I said, it's American and European oak, proportion wise around 85% of American oak and then just a small touch of sherry casks. Now the sherry casks lend the, maybe a slight touch of tannin on the back, but again, this is, as Brian Kinsman would say, it has 
that glenfiddichness. So it is light, fruity, touch of vanilla, coming out at 40%. So if you don't have a, a little jam of this at home, feel free to have a, a jam of whatever you've got close to hand. As a student said, it's Thursday night. Um, and I think you're a few hours ahead than us, but it has just cracked five o'clock here. So yeah, that's all the good rules, Alex, all the rules have changed now, 2020, I 2021. I don't think, if you, if you even wait till 5 p.m. now, that's, I mean, pat on the back. <laughs> Um, plus, for everybody watching in in Russia, it must be well into the into the evening now as well. So, um, as we see say up here in Scotland, slanjevar it means uh, to your health. Slanjevar. Found myself without a glass here, but and um, the. Yeah, the distillery actually, as much as you can, uh, as you can see it here, um, this is obviously just a sort of virtual uh, reinterpretation of our distillery. If you go over that hill at the back about 10 miles, you get to, to my house. And the, actually the next area I want to take you to, and hopefully some of you have tried or are going to try some Glenfiddich 15 year old. So our um, portfolio of whiskey starts with the 12. Uh, it's the really the signature, as Alex was saying, it's the it's the whiskey that sort of puts us on the map. Um, it's the green bottle that, you know, a lot of you may recognize um, from everything The you know, your, your, your five-star hotel bar to your dive bar to everything in between. We're very fortunate at Glenfiddich in that normally wherever I go in the world, at least when we used to travel, you would find a good bottle of Glenfiddich 12 somewhere. And in many cases, it's the, it's the first single malt whiskey or whiskey that a lot of people have tried as well. The iconic uh, triangular bottle is quite an interesting story. When we were launching single malt whiskey, we have two fairly young gentlemen as the, as the chairman of our, our company at that point uh, named Charlie and Sandy. And they're the third generation of the William Grant family. So our founder, William Grant, um, you know, a great story of a pioneering guy, spends his whole life working in a distillery, at the age of 47, leaves that distillery to start Glenfiddich, and he kind of calls all his sons back home. You know, his sons are uh, professionals in their own right, doctors, teachers, engineers, ones in the military. Uh, they get the call. Dad wants to build a distillery, uh, come back to Dufton, all hands on deck, and they basically build, uh, you know, Glenfiddich over the course of one year. Uh, 1886, 1887, Christmas Day, we produce whiskey for the first time at Glenfiddich, uh, and William Grant at that point is the malt master, and that's essentially he sets himself up as the guy who's going to decide what's our whiskey going to taste like, how are we going to make it, how are we going to blend casks, what's the style going to be. William Grant decides that 134 years ago. Um, he then hands over to uh, the next malt master, who's his son, John Grant, uh, who hands over to a gentleman called Gordon Ross. Uh, our malt master after that is called Hamish Robertson. We then have an amazing chap called David Stewart, who's the malt master, and our current malt master is called Brian Kinsman. So if you have a bottle of Glenfiddich, you'll see signatures somewhere with the malt master on it. Incredible to think that 134 years of making whiskey there's only been six people responsible for physically making it and deciding what it's going to taste like and what the profile is going to be. When we were looking at the whiskies in the 60s, uh, Charlie and Sandy, uh, you know, the third generation on from William Grant, find themselves in kind of a challenging position. Uh, the world is completely dominated by, single, uh, by blended scotch. Um, one in particular, really, Johnny Walker has like exploded onto the world and um, is really, uh, I suppose in many ways, opened the door to Scotch whiskey around the world. Charlie and Sandy made the decision to start talking about a whiskey that wasn't blended, but was only coming from one single place, single malt. Uh, and with that, they designed the triangular bottle. So um, the, <clears throat> this is kind of the very modern style, but the, the triangular shape was designed by a chap called Hans Schlager, now, he's a really like uh, quite disruptive, innovative designer in the 50s and 60s. Um, if you remember that thing that we used to get on, the London Underground, I don't know if anyone's been near it recently, but 
Uh, you have, have you, Alex? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's good to hear that. that uh, yeah, David. <laughs> well, Hans Schlager designed the logo for the London Underground. He did some work on the BMW logo. He designed numerous other things and he designed the Glenfiddich bottle because he wanted to represent the three simple ingredients that go into whiskey. So water, barley and yeast. Whiskey essentially is that simple. It just takes lots of time and lots of experience to get it, you know, this, this good. Um, so he wanted a triangular bottle. You know, it would be disruptive back in the 60s to see a triangular bottle on the bar back or in the shops. Um, and so they tested it out in Dufton. It was very, very popular up here uh, because you could hide the bottle of Glenfiddich underneath your bed and it would never roll out from underneath. Uh, and genuinely, if you want to do that at home, that's fine. Uh, hide it under your desk. Uh, we're not going to judge wherever you want to, wherever you're going to put that whiskey. Hey, as long as it's Glenfiddich, right? Otherwise, it will roll out. So I want to taste Glenfiddich 15. Um, this is um, basically what's been getting me through lockdown. Uh, Glenfiddich 15 is <laughs> the, it's a beautiful whiskey and it's innovative in its own right. So that's the bottle there. Hopefully some of you got some at home. If not, you know, I highly recommend trying this Glenfiddich. It's a stunning whiskey for normally a very, very good price wherever you are. Um, it's all made here in warehouse number eight. Uh, and it's made in that really large vat in the background, which um, this is my colleague, uh, Mike Dawson, who uh, is warehouse manager responsible for creating this wonderful thing, which is the 15 year old um, Solera. Um, Alex, do you want to give the once over on the Solera tasting notes and the profile on that? Love to. Um, so as Struan said, this is warehouse eight. Probably one of my favorite places to, to go to at, at the distillery, just in terms of the Solera vats and the vastness of them. You can see there um, next to a person, the Solera vat is extremely large in size. Now, Solera, um, for those of you that are familiar with the world of sherry or lovers of sherry, I know that I am. Um, this was actually quite an interesting dram that I shared with my mother over Christmas. And she said, it says, Solera, is it sherry? And I said, no, but let me explain it to you. So why do we use, uh, why do we choose to name it a Solera or our Solera 15? So essentially back in the late 90s, 96, 97, 98, David Stewart, who was the malt master at that particular time before Brian got on board, um, at Glenfiddich, we've always, had, we've always had a way of doing things in our own particular way, um, going around problems or things that come up in our way, and we like to challenge them. We also like to come up with our own ideas and say, you know, kind of what if we do this, what will happen? What if we do X, Y, Z, what will the result be? So this is a really good prime example of maybe I, I, I want to say an early incarnation of what is now our experimental series, even though the Glenfiddich 15 is in our core range. It was something that had never been done before. Uh, we were definitely the first people to, to do a Solera system whiskey. Now, a Solera system normally is used in the world of sherry production, where you would have several floors of barrels laid on top of each other. Those are all married together to result in an end finished product of various ages. Now, what you will expect to find in a Solera vat or our Solera vat is that exact same thing. We're just doing it in a bit of a different way. So if you've ever been to a whiskey distillery or a distillery before, stacking barrels on top of each other would be extremely impractical and also extremely dangerous. Um, we don't like to take risks on whatever we do. So to make things more consistent, we built this, which is our Solera vat. So you can see the size in comparison to a, a regular cask or regular casks of which we have European American and new American oak or virgin American oak. So the size of this is 38,000 liters in size. Now compared to an American standard barrel or a sherry cask, which can range from 220 to 500 liters, it gives you an idea of just how big this vat is. Again, you can see Mikey there just completely dwarfs him. And Mikey isn't the smallest guy in the world. It's a um, big guy right there. He's a big guy. So you can see him there. And what he's doing is he's pouring these various casks into a well 
These are then getting fed into our Solera vat. Now, why is it classed as a Solera vat? So back in 1998, this Solera vat was filled, it was brimmed to the top with minimum of 15 years old of whiskey. Now, these are 15 year old whiskies in American, European, and new virgin oak. So the American and European oak, again, the split and the ratio is more or less similar to the Glenfiddich 12, but we also have that addition of virgin American oak. So the virgin American oak or new oak that hasn't been used before, we take a proportion of our American oaked Glenfiddich, and then we essentially finish that whiskey off for a period of around up to six months in these virgin casks. Now what that does is it lends itself to almost a slight kind of piney freshness I always find with the Glenfiddich 15. And it, that's what makes it different. So if you was to see, a, I do, during, um, we do many kind of tastings for bartenders, consumers, trade. And normally if you was to do a linear tasting, you would expect the 15 year old to be three years older than the 12 year old, which it is, but it's not an exact, it's not the same whiskey that's just been simply aged for three more years. There is a lot more going on. So we call it a Solera system because in over 22 years, it's never been emptied more than halfway. So essentially we use the Solera vat as a marrying ton to, to marry all those flavors together. Then afterwards, after it has been married, um, we then take that and further marry it to improve consistency and quality and make sure that all those flavors are binded together. So essentially it is a very, very complex whiskey considering that it is technically only three years older. Um, the reason why we, we can't call it anything over than 15 years old is because once it leaves that cask, enters our vat, um, if it's over 700 liters, it basically doesn't age anymore. So once it goes into that 38,000 liter vat, it's simply just marrying together. It's mingling all those flavors together and allowing everything to balance itself out. So the 15 year old, a lot more complex. It's got a bit more going on uh, in terms of kind of richness, sweetness, um, slight dryness as well from the virgin oak and just slightly more sherry cask in the 15. So yeah, that's our Glenfiddich 15 year old. It is personally my, probably one of my favorite Glenfiddichs just in well, terms it got, of- It got me through 2020, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I think uh, whenever we talk about 15 year old, it's, I wish that technology had like advanced so that we could do smell a vision or <laughs> taste division um, because that that warehouse where we make um, Glenfiddich 15, as soon as you walk in there, you get hit with this incredible aroma. Um, these warehouses in most cases are around, you know, a hundred, you know, over a century old. So they've got years and years of whiskey kind of maturing away uh, inside them. Uh, and um, especially with that 15, I think it's just such a great, you know, way of making whiskey and um, combining all those casts together. I don't know if you've ever sat down to make ramen or borscht or up here you would make cullen skink, which is our kind of local type of delicacy soup. Making this particular whiskey is a bit like that. You're taking different casks. They all have like their own slightly different flavor. You know, each cask at a distillery is going to be like a fingerprint. You know, no two are the same. Uh, but with the 15 year old, we kind of combine them together so that they're greater than the sum of their parts uh, in the same way that making um, really, really good soup, which making soup and drinking 15 year old is essentially what I did uh, last year. <laughs> Andre, what's a really good Russian soup that I should learn how to make? Uh, the which one? Which is the best? Um, most of the uh, famous soup is uh, she. Okay. Fish soup. Soup with uh, kebab. But the, the microphone's not that great on you, Andre. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Borscht is good. Borscht. One of the famous soup in Russia uh, is she with uh, kebab. And meat. Yeah. Yeah, I had some great borscht in uh, in uh, in Eastern Europe a good few times as well. Yeah. 
Whiskey making is a lot like making good soup. That's uh, that's, a, that's a learning from this part. Um, we are getting to my favourite stage of a whiskey tasting where we get to talk about Glenfiddich, 18 year old. Um, we are very fortunate at Glenfiddich to have um, a team of uh, crafts people known as our Coopers, work in a cooperage. If you want to make world-class whiskey, you need a team of craftsmen and women behind you. So Stillman, you know, coppersmiths, coopers, um, warehousemen, everybody combined. But it's the coopers, I think, that do their fair share of the hard work. So a really kind of old fashioned and traditional um, vocation using very traditional kind of tools, tools that are incredibly valuable to the cooper. Um, and our head cooper, this young man that you can see here is called Ian McDonald. So Ian is, um, he just celebrated 50 years with us last year. He retired on his 50th year. Uh, and I was very lucky to go to his retirement uh, party, which um, you can imagine that retirement parties at distilleries are pretty fun. Uh, this one certainly was. Um, halfway through the event, Ian was very annoyed because he realized that he'd actually started working 50 years and one day ago. And he'd done one day extra, but that's another that's another story. Um, we call uh, Ian is about maybe five foot one, five foot two. He's not a very tall guy, so he's quite often called the Mini Cooper uh, or the Mini, Mini Cooper S because he's a special edition. Only the Mini Cooper S could last fifty years. Mm. But what um, what you can see there is Ian. Um, repairing what's called a, a puncheon, distillery puncheon. This would be a cask that the, the Coopers would actually have built themselves, uh, made of American oak. Uh, and the Coopers art, the Coopers craft is essentially all about making the most of that maturation process. So single malt like Glenfiddich, it has to be aged a minimum of three years in oak, uh, you know, to be called Scotch whiskey. Obviously, most of us mature for far longer. If you do taste a whiskey after three years in oak, it can be, you know, um, I mean, it can be very enjoyable, don't get me wrong, but it can also be quite a potent, quite a strong flavor. So it's actually, you know, that oak, that maturation in oak that's going to mellow the whiskey down and get these wonderful flavors that we've been talking about, vanillas and uh, all the sort of high notes, citrus, floral flavors, you can get sherry notes, rich fruit. All of those will come from a little bit of the what we would call the distillery character. So what does Glenfiddich taste like on day one? What we call new make spirit or cleric up here. And then what does the whiskey taste like mature character? And whiskey tastings are very much kind of a harmony between those two things. So Glenfiddich on day one, it tastes... It's beautiful. It's very floral, green grass, um, pear and apple, and it's sweet. And certainly if you're a blender or a noser of whiskies, you would say that Glenfiddich is like a top dresser. It's a very fine, um, estery, fruity style of, of new make spirit of whiskey. Then when Glenfiddich ages, and if, you know, Ian and his team of Coopers have done a good job, which they always have, um, Glenfiddich starts to, you know, starts to come through with flavors that are more along the lines of some vanillas, some rich oak flavors, the complexity. Um, it's one of the reasons actually we really recommend if you're having a dram of whiskey, add a little bit of water, just a time, however, however much you want. Um, because the, the flavors that are derived from, from oak, uh, a lot of them are a little bit hydrophobic. That means they don't like water. Um, so when you add that water into the whiskey glass, it's actually going to push a lot of the flavors up to the top. So if you're nosing and tasting a whiskey and you've now been to a very educational tasting from Glenfiddich, um, nose it first and it might taste or smell a little bit closed. Um, it might be just like trying to release its flavors, but not quite. Uh, add a bit of water and what you'll find is loads of those flavors are suddenly bursting out. So it's a nice little tip. And Whenever you nose or taste any whiskey in the world and someone tells you what, what do you think about this, just put it to your nose, shut your eyes, nod a little bit, and then go, hmm, vanilla, 
and some type of oak. So maybe go um vanilla and sweet oak or toasted oak, or you could go um subtle vanilla. Basically, every whiskey in the world smells a little bit like vanilla and oak. That's kind of a standard. So if you ever want to make it look like you're an expert, I've been doing it for years and look at where we are now. Uh, <laughs> so this is a, yeah, this is a cooperage. Um, you can see actually, you know, the, the barrel building process. It's, it, 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 you know, it's a very old fashioned kind of world where there's no glue, there's no nails. It's basically like the wood is um, kept in place by the pressure within. So once you fill that cask, it's those hoops around the edge that's gonna keep it in place. Um, and when you think that, you know, Glenfiddich might be maturing for 12 years as a minimum, but anything up to 50 or 60 years in that cask, the barrels are incredibly, you know, important. Mm. Um, and if you do have some Glenfiddich 18, I would say, um, you know, you're, you're really going to get uh, a nice influence of, of cask from that, from that Glenfiddich 18. Um, definitely comes through with nice influence from the barrel. Um, and if Glenfiddich 12 year old smells like that kind of soft pear and apple fresh from the tree, then the 18 year old is going to be that same pear and apple, but sort of evolved, stewed, you know, a lot richer and more complex. Um, and if, you, um, if you're looking for a kind of after dinner whiskey, if you're looking for a whiskey that's going to be, um, you know, a little bit, um, maybe a little bit more sort of bold and robust, some tannin uh, coming through, uh, the Glenfiddich 18 is a really, a really nice place to, to start on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex, we got, to, we got to an hour quite quickly. Uh, anything to add on Glen, Glenfiddich 18? Anything else you want to add on the tasting? Um, I think well, I'll, I'll just finish up um, with the 18. As it, it, it's, it, again, I'm not just saying this because I work for Glenfiddich. It is one of those whiskies that I always go back to and it always surprises me. Something is quite unique about our range of whiskies that we have at Glenfiddich. And it's unique in a sense of we only make three whiskies at Glenfiddich out of our huge range of whiskies that we make around the world that are made in the same way. Now, when I say made in the same way, here's what I mean. So as Jurian said, the 12 year old, it starts with those fresh fruity flavors, sweet vanilla, apples, pears. Um, I'm not a huge fan of tasting notes, but that is what you normally find light and fruity. The 18 year old, again, same process, same whiskey, just aged for slightly longer. And we have a different ratio of cask makeup. So whereas the 12 year old has that high influx of American oak with the 18 year old, that's been brought down and we introduce a touch more sherry. So you get a lot more tannin, um, but you also get a lot more of the sweet notes. So um, more kind of, as Struan said, more stewed fruits, and then the second one in our linear lineup would be the Glenfiddich 30 year old. So those, those flavors are ramped up yet again to kind of rich fig, dark chocolate, really, really unctuous dark fruits. Its flavor profile has gone through the roof again. Now, those are the only three whiskeys that are made using those marries of, marries of um, marriages of casks using different ratios. Everything else, so imagine that's the big trunk, the backbone of Glenfiddich. And then everything that we do other than that is a little branch coming off of that. So to, in our cask makeup of a million casks at the distillery, we have a huge amount of things that we can play around with and just have fun with whiskey and see what we can do. So that the Glenfiddich 18 year old for me is, again, it's that kind of turned up flavors of fresh and fruity. And also if you notice, on the, if you pick up a bottle of Glenfiddich 18, it does say small batch. Now, nowadays, especially in London, small batch, artisanal, uh, crafted, these are all words that sometimes get thrown around quite flippantly. Um, but the Glenfiddich 18 year old is 100% small batch. Now to put that into context, if we were to be making a batch of Glenfiddich 12 year old, we would normally be doing batches of around 400 casks, more or less. With the Glenfiddich 18 year old, the maximum amount of cast that we'll use for a batch is 150. Now, normally we, that would be between 100 to 120, 
Um, so it gives you an idea of the scale of the Glenfiddich 18 year old. Each one is going to be slightly different, but along with the A, we'll have that overall theme of stewed fruits um, and kind of dark chocolate. And also it's Brian Kinsman's favorite. So if the master de Silla says that it's his favorite and it's his true taste of space side, and I think there's nothing else to be said on that one. That's why I just got really, uh, I was just really enjoying the tasting notes and took, <laughs> every day's a school day, right? I, was never, I never really considered 12 and 18 being the only whiskies that we have that are made the exact same way. So Glenfiddich has like a huge portfolio of different whiskies that you'll find out there. Um, we have an experimental series, uh, more focused on kind of cask finishing. We have a Grand range, some of which you can see, you know, behind me, which is, Whiskey is kind of 21 years and up, obviously getting into some really kind of special whiskies and um, over the sort of 200 pounds mark. Uh, and, uh, and then a range of whiskies going up through 30, 40, 50 years. So I guess one of the big benefits of five generations of family ownership is we have casks um, dating back um, many, many decades. And um, a lot of distilleries just don't have that. In the whole of Irish whiskey, actually, you won't find a whiskey older than 30 years. So our distillery is, um, you know, is, 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 we're just very fortunate to have the whiskies that we do. Um, I'm aware that we went over an hour and I know how schedules are uh, these days. Um, I will hand over for any questions. We had one question just to kick off from Rachel about the use of um, peat. Um, and the, the sort of lessening of peat and how that would affect production. Um, certainly what, what I've been told with the, the West Coast distillers, we don't actually use too much peat ourselves in most of our production, but there is a lot of peat in Scotland. And actually globally, I think a lot of the world's surface is covered in peat. It's basically just an, uh, an incomplete decomposition of soil, which has been sort of sitting in water and Half of Scotland is covered in peat, so we're not we're not running out anytime soon. Um, I know that like vast areas of like the Amazon, for example, there is you know so much peat in the soil there that um, that's gonna it can be very dangerous actually when these places go on fire because peat itself is a wonderful fuel source. But I remember when I lived in Singapore and the Indonesian jungle used to go on fire and all the peat would catch, and Singapore would just be God, like engulfed in smoke for like weeks on end but uh, being from Scotland I quite like the smell that's <laughs> the ironic thing like a cigar it never goes out it, it just burns oh god I would love a cigar that never went out <laughs> <laughs> Andre anything to anything to add uh, on the tasting tasting Glyphy 15 oh my, my favorite very that's nice small bottle <laughs> guys any any questions from you from you all yes. uh, thank you it's been very enlightening and uh, i've thoroughly enjoyed the tasting of all three thank you thank you brian glad that you could join us yeah i'm in north lincolnshire i'm not, not in london oh, it's, oh i actually Actually, just for the guys at Glen Fiddick, uh, at Fiddick, I actually went to the Anan Distillery three years ago, and had just been going then for three years, and they'd had their we we did try the uh, obviously their first first whiskey because it was literally just over three years. Mm. So interesting. Yeah, it was good to see that some something that had been idle for possibly 80 odd years had uh, been brought back to life. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, David Gardner, do you, have a, do you have a question? Yes, I don't know whether you can hear me. Are you aware that they are now uh, starting to run up a distillery in Kaliningrad? Oh, really? This is a project which has been going for some years now. And uh, just oh, recently they were looking for 5,000 tons of high quality malted barley. And um, 
Previously, I'd also like the previous speaker, whose name I can't quite read because I don't have my glasses on, but, but I've also been to the Annandale uh, plant and met David Thompson there, uh, who has reconstructed the, uh, the, the previous Annandale distillery. It's a very interesting project, very mm. interesting indeed. But anyway, I'm drinking Kale Isla which is uh, from the other side of Speyside, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a, an exceptionally good whiskey. And uh, I, I should add that uh, previously I'd lived in Kilmarnock from uh, what about 19, the early mid sixties until the early seventies, uh, where I often used to visit the uh, Johnny Walker plant, although I was in a different industry but mainly because one of my neighbors was the manager of the bottling plant. So it was a very good, that's a good neighbor to have, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, formed my young life. <laughs> and certainly I think Johnny Walker really put Kilmarnock on the, on the map. I know that at one point it was uh, really considered one of the, uh, the great cities of the empire. And I know, uh, Johnny Walker leaving Kilmarnock, it really, it really struggled, I think, after, after they departed. Yes, yes. In fact, the, uh, when I first went there, I was in digs with uh, a family called Quigley and uh, the mother-in-law of the host was in fact the first woman taster in Johnny Walker for all the <laughs> years that they'd been operating. And she often used to add just a small amount of water to the whiskey. So I was interested in the point you made. The, cru the crucial thing about adding water to your whiskey is if you add too much water, you can always add more whiskey. True. <laughs> and if you add too much whiskey, you can always add more water. Yeah. And if you've added too much water, you can add more whiskey. And that's essentially what we call lunch uh, up in, uh, <laughs> in Spaceside. <laughs> Uh -huh. Or if you are worried about putting water in your whiskey, put it into the person's next to you. <laughs> That's always a good one. Oh, yeah, oh, did you have a question? James, is it possible to say a couple of words? Yeah, sure. Yeah, can you hear me? Well, uh, guys, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Actually, it was, uh, you know, my idea to ask William Grant to give this virtual tour. So my name is Olga Pichurina and I'm, I'm here in Moscow, I'm head of the Moscow office, and James is my colleague in London. So James, thank you for um, uh, moderating this today. But guys, what I wanted to, to tell you, do you see me? Yes, I can see you, Olga. Right. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that in 2013, I was at your distillery. I remember all these wonderful pictures you have shown today. And as a small surprise, I can tell you that what I'm keeping. Here is a little present <laughs> I have oh, yeah. from your distillery. And actually I asked like, is it possible to have some whiskey of my age? And so that was 1974. And uh, so I had a couple of dogs, you call it a dog of whiskey to the yeah, small yeah. bottle. <laughs> yeah. And also I have got this little thing you see, it still has got some on it. <laughs> it's just such a nice, great presence you're giving to those who are having sort of like a nice um, whiskey uh, testing. Uh, it was an hour or two or three, I don't remember. And you know, I can say for the Russians, it was very difficult to sort of spit out different whiskeys because for Russians, not possible. We were drinking all up to the bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it took like probably two or three hours for the whole whiskey testing. Well, thank you very much, guys, for this. It's like really nice memories. And I have got this like a um, um, sign from, I think, Brian Robinson. Is he still there? Do you know? Because he Brian, was yeah, he around. used to head up the visitor center. He actually is now working at a neighboring distillery, but I see Brian a lot, yeah. Tell hello and tell him that was my best ever excursion <laughs> in my life. Well, he gave you some 1974 whiskey, yes. so it can't be. He obviously liked you, Olga. <laughs> you know, and I said, like, is it possible? And he said, like, mm, it's a bit difficult, but let's try. And so that was my question. Why do you call it a dog? Why this little thing uh, called, called it dog? I forgot. I've forgotten completely, if you can. Or oh, if it, it traditionally, um, 
if any of the guys working at the distillery wanted to take some whiskey home with them, shall we say, uh, and it wasn't entirely legal, they would take a little piece of uh, copper pipe inside the uh, inside their trouser leg, and the copper pipe. If you found a cast that you liked the taste of, like in 1974. Uh, the dog would go down inside the cask and then you would fill it with whiskey and put it back down in the in the trouser leg. So taking the whiskey home was called uh, walking the walking the dog. So walking the dog in Scotland is a is a sort of byword for taking a whiskey home. Nobody could uh -huh. work out why everybody used to walk home with a limp, but it's because they had whiskey down one trouser leg and uh, Thank you very much for reminding and thank you very much for all my best, you know, memory of the, of your place. Good thank luck. You, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> you you've done exactly what I wanted. So that's brilliant and I I hope many members who joined us just really liked it and I, and I know that we are recording it so they will see it. Thank you a lot. Perfect. Thank you so much Strun and Alex and everyone who joined us this evening. Um yeah, I will upload this video if you would like to rewatch this feel free to visit our website again. So have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, you very hey, much. Man. And uh, Nastrovia, right? Yes, Nastrovia. <laughs> Nastrovia. Nastrovia. Nastrovia.